Welcome to another episode on NC Ancestry. Today's episode is part two about Edgecombe County and what records and resources are there for genealogists. Hear all about it from Program Director of Historic Preservation at Edgecombe Community College, Monica Fleming. Hey, if we've not met before, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family research. If you've not seen part one, make sure that you do so as it is, has a ton of information about the records that are available online, offline, and in person in Edgecombe County. You can find a link to all of that in my detailed show notes below. You can also sign up for the NC Ancestry newsletter and have it emailed to you. And you can find it on ncancestry.com on the Edgecombe County page. Here in part two, we dive further into the history of the area and more information about what is available to you based on the era in which you are researching. Make sure you watch it all the way through to learn about the rich history of Edgecombe County and the surrounding counties all the way back to the early migrations. Make sure you subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. Also check out Genealogy TV, the other YouTube channel, and follow Genealogy TV on Facebook. You ready? Here it comes. Part two of Edgecombe County with Monica Fleming right now. Give us a little bit of background about um, the history in, in the Tarboro, Edgecombe County area. We know that the that Tarboro is sitting on the Tar River, which was yes. a transport at one point. Is that how the town was founded? Yes. Um, the county was formed in 1741 <clears throat> and it was much larger. And in 1758, the county seat was Enfield. And when they cut out Halifax County, Enfield became a part of Halifax because they used a creek as a dividing line. So there was no county seat in Old Edgecombe. And they laid out a new town on the Tar River. Um, Tarboro is about as far up river as you can go. If you look at that 1882 map you have, the river starts getting real crooked. And so we're about as far up river as you can go in a boat. A boat. In a boat. And it starts getting too crooked to go. So they laid out the town here in 1760 in November. And we actually have the original deed and a plat showing all the blocks of land and who bought which blocks in our deed books in the Register of Deeds office. Wow. Really nice. And we have traced some of the property um, through various documents. So we can trace it from its 1760 all the way up to the present day as to who owns what property. So anyway, the town was established in 1760. Um, it grew slowly, um, Tarboro did. And after the revolution, they wanted to have a seat in the state legislature. Um, they didn't quite have enough people, but because we didn't have a state capital, the legislature moved around. And in the 1780s, the legislature actually met here in Tarboro um, a couple of times and vied for the state capital, but didn't get enough votes. Neither did Fayetteville or Hillsboro. They kept trying right. to decide. Um, I did hear one, read one comment that in favor of Edgecombe County um, is that Tarboro had good peach brandy. So that's <laughs> about it. <laughs> so that's anyway, um, the town continues to grow and it becomes prosperous in the 1850s. It is one of the larger, the railroad actually comes to town in um, 1859, 1860. Uh, the uh, Wilmington to Weldon, Weldon Railroad was completed in 1840, but they didn't put a spur line to Tarboro until 1860. And once that happened, again, the railroads were going in and out of here, so we're an important trade center. We did have a newspaper, as we mentioned, and it was um, printed during the war. Um, we know that the railroad stopped here during the war. After the war, it continued. We had new rail lines created after the war. So there was a big growth spurt in the area in the 1880s, um, up through about the turn of the century. And we have some fairly good records of that. Um, we have a new record that, a uh, collection of records that were, Digital NC is, is slowly scanning. We'll have available hopefully by the summer. Um, we were given, um, 30 to 50 volumes of a store ledger from a store from 1890 until 1920. Every year with every purchase by every person and the um, state uh, digital NC has agreed to scan the 1890s versions because we have no 1890 census. And so this way we were 
have a list of who was living here in the county and what kind of things they bought. Um, so that just, helps fill the gap between census. Right. And, and we will have that fully indexed by the end of the summer so people can search the index, find a family name, and then they can go to the scanned image and look and see um, what their ancestor bought and where, you know, if their ancestor was living here at that time. So um, we have the mercantile records for the W.S. Clark uh, General Store, um, again, for about 30 years of records that we have. So um, the town continues to grow. Around um, early 1900s, there was talk about putting a college here. Um, the people in town voted it down, and the college ended up in a little neighboring town called Greenville. And so there's a big growth spurt in Greenville afterwards that we didn't have here. The town has remained fairly small, um, but when the railroads developed again around 1900, new little communities like Pine Tops and Macclesfield uh, developed as railroad stations. So we do have railroad stations. We have some records on some of those stations and some of the buildings, the depots. Uh, unfortunately, in 1960s, we had an administration that started tearing down buildings because we used to have a beautiful town hall mm. down in the 1960s and built a modern one. And then they tore down the courthouse, which had been here since 1835 and built a modern. Um, so we have pictures. We have pictures of those old buildings. But the good news is when that happened in the 60s, that coincided with the National Preservation Act. And we started a historical society and we started preserving our buildings. So Tarboro has one of the largest historic districts in North Carolina. We have over 300 structures in a 45 block district dating the earliest house we have in town, still standing, dates to 1785. Um, and wow. we have over two dozen houses that are pre-Civil War. And then we have probably 150 that are Victorian. So we have lots of historic houses and records on these houses. Um, and again, the newspapers. So there's, there's some good information available about this community. Um, Tarboro is just a great town. I just loved walking through the, you know, looking at all those houses with the big wraparound Southern porches, you know, and just, it's a, it's a beautiful little town. It is. And we have a historic museum in town called the Blunt Bridgers House, and they're open a few days a week. Something new we have that people might not think about, um, and you may not know about this because we're reopening this coming week, but we have the Edgecombe County Veterans Museum, which has been in operation for about 10 years, and it has over a thousand photographs of veterans who've served from this county. We also have a local library. We also have some military records, all at the Veterans Museum, on military history and soldiers. And we have records on Revolutionary War soldiers, Civil War soldiers, Spanish-American soldiers. Um, not much, but, you know, some of the information, yeah. about Fold 3, but some of the information we have from family files. We also have a huge collection of um, uniforms um, and military materials. We have a sword um, from a soldier from the Mexican-American War. We have a Medal of Honor winner, and we have a display on him. And you might recall the name of General Hugh Shelton, who was um, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Clinton administration and one of the Bush administrations. Um, he is from Edgecombe County, from the little town of Speed, and he has donated a number of items about military history uh, and this region um, to the Veterans Museum. So we have a separate library in the Veterans Museum for people interested in learning about military um, ancestors. I have wow, one. who knew? Well, you mentioned the library a couple times. I do know that there was a history, at least there was back when I used to go there, uh, a history room there uh, yes. that had a lot of good genealogy stuff. And I the think that's where Pam located. works, right? That's where Pam works and that's the, um, it's the local history room. It's called the Janie Allsbrook Room because Janie, Miss Janie was a librarian for many years, and so they named that room after her. It is packed full. And there's also in Rocky Mount, which is half in Edgecombe and half in Nash, there is the Braswell Library in Rocky Mount, and Tracy Thompson runs the local history room over there, and they also have material. Um, she, has some, she has a wonderful clipping file of material of families and businesses in the Rocky Mount area that we don't have here in Tarboro, but again, that's part of Edgecombe County. 
So um, don't overlook the Rocky Mount Library. Wow, good tip. Now, do you have either there in Edgecombe or the Rocky Mount Library um, information about the surrounding counties, like Martin County? Yes. Wasn't Martin County a Burn County? Um, I'm not sure. Well, actually, I just did some research on the courthouse, so you're right, because part of the courthouse had been burned. Um, I, was, I was there at the old building, um, and they're trying to restore that, by the way, the Martin County Courthouse in Williamston. But um, we do have um, census records, we do have marriage records, and we do have a clipping file for all of the connecting counties around Edgecombe. So Pitt, okay. Nash, Halifax, and Wilson. And we have a close relationship with the Wilson County Library because Wilson was formed out of Edgecombe. And there was a wonderful genealogist who died back in the 80s or 90s named Hugh Johnston. You may have run across some of his records. Mm -hmm. Hugh Johnston had, um, back before computers, would abstract newspapers and cemetery records and things like that. And his collection of papers uh, was donated to the Wilson County Library, and they sorted through, and those that were involved in Edgecombe County families are now in our library. So we okay. have Hugh Johnson's papers on his research on different families. He's got Bible records in there. He's got family files um, that he collected over 50 years. Um, now, he, is uh, that indexed by chance or searchable somehow? Um, somewhat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, you'd have to work with Pam. She's got the files, and she we have topics, and we have file folders by family name. But within the file folder, you're on your own going through them. Um, you have to, you know, search. On yeah. Your own. But, yeah, we do have some of that material. It's just too much for us to get completely indexed. Um, but because these are the original papers, and some of them are written on scraps, and it's amazing. Well, but I'm sure it takes an army of volunteers to do that kind of thing too. And I know Martin County was, is a small, uh, yes. small group of people that are trying to preserve what they can out there. Um, and, and selfishly, I ask about Martin County because again, we have Knox family relatives there and I had discovered that there was a good portion of it, uh, that disappeared. In fact, there were some churches out there that had, they're still, the buildings are still there, but, you know, trying to find some of those church records that have since moved on. Like, for example, mine was the Primitive Baptist Church in Spring, something, Green Spring. Green Spring. Um, uh, where to contact is, is contact ECU archives because we found some of the Primitive Baptist Church records in one of the old churches um, that's no longer active. And we gave them all to East Carolina's special collections because they included information on Primitive Baptist congregations in the region. Good so tip. Thank you very much. Something there. Um, I also occasionally, my husband and I um, do find a grave for people and we cover Martin County because there apparently is nobody else around who likes to visit Martin County. Um, so we do cover Martin County and there are some records. And I tell you another place to think about looking um, here is helpful in, in Edgecombe County um, is one of the funeral homes. Um, Carlisle Funeral Home, which has been in existence for over a hundred years, their records that you can, they can access only go back to the 1930s, but still it's helpful to find if you wanted to know where somebody was buried. If Carlisle handled the burial in the 1930s, they will have the records and they can tell you where that cemetery is because it may not be on find a grave. It may have been in the woods somewhere and it's long gone, but they can tell you at least where it used to be. Um, there are some other funeral homes. There's one over in Martin County. There's one in Halifax County that are also have some records, but not um, complete because they only have what they buried, but still that's a place to look. Um, Great tip. I forgot about that. Yeah. Because those, um, those burial records often have the family members of who paid the bill and right. how, the, what their relationship is to the person who passed. And yeah, yeah there's some good, good genealogy uh, finds there as well. And, and there's a I cemetery in Rocky Mount um, called Pine View and it's in the Edgecombe County side and they have a full-time staff. The city of Rocky Mount has a staff. And so, like you said, they have the complete records for that cemetery, which dates back to 1898 or somewhere. So, again, that's a good way to look for records is to check some of the, the town cemeteries. Um, 
not just the church cemeteries. Okay, selfishly, if someone were going to look in that pine view, because I know that's in our family too, <laughs> where exactly would I go? Um, if you go to the City of Rocky Mount website, okay. um, you can find Pine View Cemetery, and they have a, an email and a phone number. Um, so you can call her. I can't remember the lady's name who runs it right now, but they're four and a half days a week, and they have a map, and they'll tell you what plot number, and they'll tell you how to get to the plot. Beautiful. So, Thank you for that. Some stuff for Pine View. Pine View is a huge cemetery. It's, it's the largest in Rocky Mount. And so those records date back to the 1890s, and the city has done a good job of keeping those. So that's a good place to look. Excellent. Um, did, did Tarboro or Edgecombe County have much participation in the Civil War? Um, there was a skirmish here in July of 1863. It was the same one that involved um, Rocky Mount, where um, Union soldiers marched off, a cavalry unit marched off from Newburn where they had occupied since earlier in the war. And they came up here and they split up around Old Sparta. Park came into Tarboro, set the bridge on fire, burned some of the warehouses and burned an ironclad. Another group went to Rocky Mountain and burned Battle Mills. Um, then they were run out of town. Uh, an ambush, a group from Fort Branch over in Hamilton in Martin County, um, came over here and ran the Yankees out of town. Um, and there were, unfortunately, some uh, casualties. Um, the, some were brought to the hospital. We did have a Civil War hospital here. And we don't have the original hospital records, but we do have um, documents to indicate burials of soldiers. And we know that the Union soldiers were put in a grave in the town cemetery. And after the war, um, as a part of the war recovery, uh, in 1867 to 1870, um, they went and tried to recover the graves. And the five soldiers who were buried here from a New York regiment were sent back home to New York and they were identified. So we know where they were buried and when their bodies were moved out of here. So, um, so yes, we did have a skirmish here. We had a couple of raids that came close. Um, we have a, a number of people who were here um, involved in the war. I've got a record of at least 1,400 men who were engaged. Uh, and if you want to read an interesting story about the war in this region, um, the Journal of a Secesh Lady, which is published by State Archives, mm -hmm. diary of Catherine Edmondson Devereaux, and, or Catherine Devereaux Edmondson, let me rephrase that. And it's her Civil War diary from 1861 to about 1866. She actually lived in Scotland Neck. She's buried in Trinity Churchyard in Scotland Neck, which is an old um, churchyard. And the State Archives published her diary, so they have it available. And I think it's online now. Um, but in any case, she has like reports of where her friends in Hamilton or her friends in um, Scotland Neck or in Tarboro, their sons in the war and things like that. So she has an interesting account of things that she hears about going on during the war. I found it a whole lot better read uh, than some of the other diaries that are better known from the Civil War. So, no, there's a tip. Good. Yeah. So, stepping forward in time a little bit, uh, I know that uh, the flu epidemic yes. uh, was hit hard in the Tarboro area. Yes. Um, we have records that they closed the schools um, in 19, the fall of 1918, and they did not open them up till the next year. Um, to net till the next fall. So there was no graduating class in 1919. And we actually have one of their yearbooks from 1920 that says it's a combined, the students, you know, there was a tremendous amount of flu. They closed the churches. They closed a lot of things uh, in this area. Now, interestingly enough, in 1919 is the date we have on the wall outside for the first theater in this area. And the building is still standing. It's being restored. And um, it was a theater from 1919 and until the 1970s. And so we have the building and we have newspaper ads and other things. And we have some old pictures. Sometimes you'll see them on Randy's yesteryear. And he actually has done some research where he has a picture of the marquee and then he'll look up the movie and say, well, this is what we're showing. And he'll have a picture of you oh, know, that's funny. stars. But yeah. Um, so the, the theater came along in 1919, but two other things in Tarboro. 
which make us a little bit special. We had the first um, county health department in North Carolina established right after the flu epidemic. And we had the first city owned milk plant in the entire South. And the milk plant building is still there and there's a little plaque outside um, because we were worried about people getting sick. And so they encourage farmers to bring their milk in and get it pasteurized. And we had milk delivery to your house. We actually have a picture of the wagon um, that would go and deliver milk to the houses every day. White milk, chocolate milk, butter and cream. Um, Man, those people probably thought, wow, this is modern technology. That was. <laughs> and the milk plant stayed in operation from 1920 till about 1950. So um, there's some good pictures about the milk plant. I remember being milk being delivered to the front porch. <laughs> and um, we, we also had one other thing. Um, M.S. Brown, we call him Coca-Cola Brown. He owned the Coca-Cola plant with his brother. They came here about in the night, late teens with the Coca-Cola plant. And he was an amateur photographer. And he died recently and left over, I want to say, 2,000 photographs to the local library. And Pam is slowly getting those digitized and getting them online. God bless her. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, um, she has negatives too. These are being done with Digital NC. Um, they're working with her, and they've put probably two or three hundred already online on Digital NC. But see, if you want to know what life was like here in Tarboro in the 1950s, go look at the MS Brown collection. It's wonderful. I know my husband's uh, uh, father worked for the uh, Seven Up Bottling Company there mm -hmm. uh, too. So it wasn't just Coca Cola. <laughs> Um, and we had a phone company. The phone company opened here in 1896, Carolina Tell and Tell. And there are a few records available about the phone company um, because we, we have one information about the doctor, uh, Dr. Mercer, got the first phone. He wanted phone number, call, phone number one, so he said it would be easier for the patients to call him. That, but he got the first phone and he couldn't understand why he wasn't getting any calls because he was the only one that had a phone. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> he couldn't wait for somebody to call him. <laughs> right. he wait for the other phones to get established. <laughs> now you can't get a doctor's phone number. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, World War Two, World War One, and World War Two. Actually, do any presence, anything happening? In oh yes, um, Miss Maddie Shackelford was mm -hmm. a nurse here. She was from Virginia. She was a nurse here, and she went overseas and served in World War One came back and she was the first president or whatever the office is of the local American Legion chapter, first female. Um, and she built a memory chapel here in the county at behind the Presbyterian church. And she helped fund an uh, organization to help recognize veterans. And she used to lead the veterans parade. So we have records on this Maddie and things like that. And she documented all the veterans grave sites, Civil War, Spanish American War, and World War I in the county before she died. And um, World War II, uh, again, the Veterans Museum has hundreds of photographs now of World War II soldiers. And so we're adding to that all the time to gather information about um, any veterans that have served in Edgecombe County. And we have a veterans mural painted on, on the old theater wall, that, that 1919 theater, on the whole wall beside it, there is a beautiful veterans mural um, commemorating all the different wars from the revolution up to Desert Storm. And we also have all different branches of service, um, Army, Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, and Air Force. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff about the veterans that are now available that we didn't have before. So we do have good records or information about World War II. Oh, so recently we found in the Veterans Museum, where my, I'm helping my husband because he's the librarian of the Veterans Museum, but we recently found um, some orders and some files from some soldiers about their term in World War II, their service. So we have some battalion records, which are fascinating. I th my husband thinks they're fascinating. I think they're just military records. But I'm a military brat, so I'm sort of used to military records. Yeah, it's old hat for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wasn't there something about uh, prison encampments there in Tarboro? Okay. Um, actually, Martin County had the World War II 
internment camp for POWs, and they had Italians and Germans, and they were stationed in Martin County. But Edgecombe County arranged for short-term loans, so they would bring some prisoners here and put them in tents on the ball field during harvest season, and the men would go and work, and the farmers, because there were not enough men here because they were all fighting the war, they would use these prisoners. And we actually have in the Winslow papers I was mentioning earlier, Mr. Winslow has a document in there, um, and that's digitized, and it's online at the ECU collection, showing where he had so many prisoners come and stack peanuts. They had to harvest the peanuts, and this back when you used to stack them in the field. Mm -hmm. And he had to pay the government um, 10 cents for every stack that the prisoners made. So he had to pay them for their labor. Um, and so we actually have that document. And the story is by some of the locals who were in member this time period, that some of the Italian prisoners um, were brought out to the town common and would sing opera on the common on Sunday afternoons. No way. Yes, oh, and some of the people didn't, know, didn't understand them, but they understood it was opera, operatic music, you know. Um, hey, music is music, right? Yeah, we didn't have a permanent settlement like they did in Martin County. The big settlement was in Martin County, but we did have a small little company that was brought over here um, at different times of the year when farmers needed them. So, yes. So that's, a, that's another interesting little fact about World War II. And backing up to the Civil War, um, the Battle of Plymouth, which was one of the bigger battles in North Carolina in April of 64, um, General Hoke, who arranged that battle, um, and led the troops. They marched from Tarboro. The train stopped in Tarboro, so they marched from Tarboro to Plymouth. When they came back, they brought back 800 prisoners, and they um, imprisoned them on the town common, and they built a uh, stockade around the town common uh, and around one of the hospitals that they had there and held them until they could get the trains in to send them to various prison camps. Um, Wow, you know, I never knew. I mean, you, when you go to the town commons, and if anybody is watching that, uh, is going to end up going to Tarboro, who's never been there before. The town commons, if I recall, has some statues. Yes. Uh, and so, who knew when you when I was walking around that all that happened in the town commons? There's a lot of history yeah. there. Oh, a lot there. Yes. I Revolutionary War. Was there anything going on in the Revolutionary? We actually have. Th if you go to our courthouse, our re Gun courthouse from the 1960s. Inside are two brass plaques recognizing local soldiers who fought in the Revolutionary War. One was killed at the Battle of Germantown, and one um, died down in South Carolina um, in one of the skirmishes down there. Um, we did not have any battles here, um, but we did have a lot of volunteers to serve on the Continental Line. Um, so we do have information about that. Um, some of the soldiers who served the Continental Line from Edgecombe County. So we were just developing, Tarboro was just developing um, during that time period. And, and in fact, um, we were founded during the middle of the French and Indian War, and one of our streets is named Pitt Street. And it, a lot of people think it's for the local Pitt family, but it was actually named for William Pitt, who was Prime Minister of England during the French and Indian War. So at the time the town was laid out, Pitt Street was named for him. Um, so that's just a little, so that's as far back as we go, French and Indian War, and then Rev War, not much. Uh, we do have uh, some records of people um, in the War of 1812, um, and we recently were given some records for, um, we found, this is interesting, we found this book that had been published, and it's in the library and in the Veterans Museum, and it's a list of all the soldiers who um, went to war um, in World War I. And so we have a list of the soldiers from this area. And it was segregated at the time. So part of the book says soldiers, and then the other part of the book says colored soldiers. But it lists them all. Yeah. Wow, good. And well, that's at the Veterans Museum. Okay, because that's going to be valuable to somebody. Yes. Um, and that you said that was the War of 1812. No, that's uh, World War I. Excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. We do have we do have War of 1812 list. I'm sorry. We do have a War of 1812 soldiers. Um, that list of them was published, and it could have been Miss Maddie Shackelford that found that list. But we do have a list that has been published um, back in the 1950s of people who we know were enrolled in the War of 1812. So, 
Okay, let's rewind the time machine just a little bit farther back. Okay. So almost before Tarboro and, and that area was established, immigrants were coming from where to that, settle that area? Okay, most of our immigrants were English and Scots-Irish. We have some people who came down from Virginia because Virginia had already been established. Mm -hmm. So this part of North Carolina, nobody got in here much until after the Tuscarora War. And so that war ended in 1715. And then they started opening up what we call the back country. Because before that, everybody's living on the coast. They're living at Bath. They're mm -hmm. living at New Bern. They're living at Edenton. Mm -hmm. And after that, they come down from um, Isle of Wight, Virginia, and they come down into what was then Bertie County, and then 1741, that's why Edgecombe County gets formed in the 1740s. And so we have people coming down from Virginia. We have records of a few people coming up river. I was going to ask that next. The Tar River merges with what is called the Pamlico. It's the same river. It's just that south of Greenville is called the Pamlico. North of Greenville is called the Tar. And um, some people came up river because boat was an easier way to travel than horseback in the 1700s. And so some people came up river and we do have records of a few people, um, again, English, um, some Scots Irish coming into this area. Um, we don't have any Highland Scots that's in the central part of North Carolina, but most of the families and we did have some Quakers here, um, but they moved on further West. But we, we have some records of a few Quakers in this area in the early seven mid 1750s and then eventually they're going to move like the moravians in the western part of the state so i don't have any records of moravians um the earliest churches we have are the primitive baptist church um we do have methodist um and later uh we have episcopal uh, well it was anglican then became episcopal after the revolutionary war we don't get a presbyterian church until the 1870s we don't get a Catholic church until the 1890s. We actually had a Jewish synagogue before we had a Catholic church in this county. So interesting. Yeah. Well, and in the Episcopal churchyard, there are people buried there from Scotland and Ireland and England. So those were immigrants who moved into this area. Anything else we missed? I think we've covered everything on Edgecombe County that I can think of right now. We've covered the public library, the Veterans Museum, our library, the Rocky Mount Library, the Register of Deeds. Those are all good places to, to go out and research. Wonderful. And I will try and put links to everything I can find in the show notes, okay. whatever I can uh, fit in there. I will also put it on the ncancestry.com uh, website because I will end up writing a blog uh, based on this, uh, okay. this interview. I really right. appreciate you taking the time. Yes, ma'am. I'm say happy to do that. I was going to say, I'll send you a couple of links um, to like my, uh, our genealogy Facebook page and to mine because I teach um, weekend classes on genealogy and we have a schedule that goes out every semester. So people wow. come and take weekend classes if they want to learn more about. And I, even though I, my classes are broad enough based for the whole state, I try and use a lot of local examples. So people will find information about, may find information about their family. Wonderful. Now, uh, if people need to find you, how can they do that? Um, Edgecombe Community College. Um, you can go to the faculty directory, Monica Fleming. I'm there, um, Preservation North Carolina. I also have a Facebook page and the Historic Preservation Program has a Facebook page. Okay. So Pam may kill me for this, but how can we get a hold of Pam? <laughs> um, you have to you have to email her at the Edgecombe County uh, Memorial Library. She's um, awesome. I ran into her at the uh, State Archives one day, uh, and she probably doesn't remember me. She's uh, precious. Yes, but, she does. <laughs> she has helped me tremendously. I don't even know if she uh, has put two and two together, but she's the one who went and said, yes, your people are in this book. And I said, great, how can I buy it? Uh, and she hooked me up. So, um, you know, kudos to her. As oh, well. she is wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for letting us share with everybody. I appreciate you doing this. Oh, I love it. Well, that closes out our two-part series on NC Ancestry about Edgecombe County. I hope you enjoyed that. If so, please like and subscribe.
Special thanks to Monica Fleming for the time and the many images that you saw in the video. A copy of my show notes are available in the description area below. In the newsletter, if you sign up for the NC Ancestry newsletter, you'll get instant access there. Alternatively, uh, you can also get it on ncancestry.com on the Edgecombe County page. I hope that was helpful. Until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.